pickup truck. And I knew he was something special when I seen that truck. Bishop, we honor you, sir, and all of the bishops, bishop designees, all of the pastors, and all of the leaders, and all of the saints and friends. I do bring you greetings from Charlotte, North Carolina. I'm honored to be here. They've given me three minutes, and I need to take advantage of these three minutes real quick. And uh, so understand, if I don't get a chance to acknowledge everybody, please forgive me. But you do know that insecurity is a terrible thing. Insecurity is a terrible thing. I've been pastoring the church for 28 years, started with just my wife and I, and uh, we, we planted a ministry in Charlotte, North Carolina, the Lord's hand has been on that church, is yet today on this on that church, and we understand ministry in this post-pandemic season. For the next two and a half minutes, I do want to talk to you about not a sales, not a convincing, but there's a very practical need. During the pandemic, like many of you all, I'm sitting at home trying to figure out how we're going to pass the churches, especially online and online only. Facebook Live was of the devil uh, up until about two and a half years ago. Now everybody has some type of virtual streaming ministry. And uh, so we're in the streaming space. I opened up a consulting firm online, ordered a couple of books off of Amazon, up a consulting firm, got the LLC. And one of my clients was a client of two uh, 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 very, very wealthy men in South Florida. They had an opportunity to buy the North America rights to a church app. And uh, I've had a church app. Some of you all have had a church app. It was eye candy. We did it on the trophy shelf, and we bragged about having an app, but we never used it. This app is a 100% customizable app, very comprehensive. So everywhere from your social media to your direct streaming media. I use the word direct because the reality is this. Many of you all go streaming through Facebook Live, and if they ever decide not to do work with religious churches, 98% of us will be in trouble. But you get a direct streaming code. That being said, from giving to social media, to texting, to prayer walls, to events planning. We even have something called In Peace Play. Remember y'all, some of y'all remember the tape table, the product table. Remember the product table? You had CDs, DVDs, and all of the like, right? Well, that almost is a thing of old now, but now you can sell your own content on your app and make money while you sleep. There's so many things happening with this app. We have a tremendous relationship with Bishop James Dixon. He took his influences, he took this great body of pastors and this wonderful network of leaders and he, during his holy convocation said let's partner if we can get the race reduced can you come back in and talk to the pastors we're taking an app that typically would be 199 dollars down one time setup they've slashed that fee in half for bishop dixon it's 99 dollars one time only it's 69 a month for 12 months. Renewable, you cancel when you want to, but the reality is after those 12 months, you won't want to. It does everything you need to pastor, to minister, to evangelize, even in your virtual giving. With that being said, two things I'll say and I'll take my seat. I'm so honored to have my, some colleagues who are right here in Houston, Texas, Randy, Michelle Harden. Many of y'all are very familiar with both Randy and Michelle Harden. Would you all stand? They're our colleagues. They also serve with this great organization. We do have a table set up. We want to make sure, again, not here to convince you. We're not even here to sell you. But there's a need, a very practical need. Do you use it? I use this app every single day. And uh, please understand this. It is something that you've never seen before. You break this app to look just like your church, your people, your city, wherever region from the world you're from. And on top of that, on top of that, talking about a way now to di evangelize in the digital space. Do you not realize the average person in this room, you're on your cell phone some five hours a day? A day, not a week, a day, right? 89% of that time, you're doing something but making a phone call. So the mobile apps, the Gen, this Gen X and the, 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 the X generation, excuse me, the, the what do you call it, X, Y, G, Y, N, uh, millennials, they do business on the app all day long. They do everything on the app. I fought it for a while, but I said, you know what? I don't need eye candy anymore. I need something that will help me pastor in this virtual space. You're waiting to go back to the new norm. My brothers and sisters, this is the new norm. This is the new norm. So all those things being said, we're here to serve you. We pray that you enjoy the lunch, enjoy this opportunity to fellowship one with another. Uh, I'm from Houston, by the way. I grew up right here in Houston. Bishop, you may not know this, but my pastor was a late N.S. Brown, Progressive New Hope Baptist Church, Elgin. That's where I got saved and my daddy got saved, and we were members before we moved to North Carolina. So now I'm in the grand church of God in Christ, and uh, I won't hold against none of y'all here in this room, but I'm just happy to be with my friend, Bishop James Dixon. One more time, let's clap our hands. Let's appreciate Bishop, for this opportunity. Let, let me say this before you take your seat. Um, I, now, I want you to take your phone out. Take your phone out very quickly. Just, I know you have one. 
Bishop, I failed to say one thing. While Please. they're getting their phones out, mm -hmm. I won't name the church, but they did give us permission to say this. Yes. But they're the church right here in Houston, Texas. They were building a $75,000 app. They have multiple thousands of members. They saw this product and said, why would we continue on this process of design and development for a $75,000 app when for $99 and 69 a month, we can have the exact same features, exact same functions, all of the things included. And today, this, to this very day, they're one of our most happiest customers. And I just want to say thank you for that. Uh, praise God. Hold your phone up, please. How many of you would want to be able to get all your pastor's messages right here? If, the, if, that's, a, if that's a yes, say amen. amen. How many pastors would want the world to have access to your messages right here? Amen. Every Sunday. This app, just like your website, a person can go on the app and join a ministry. If you go on our app, you can read about our kingdom kids and youth. Sign your kids up. You can go on and read about women of faith. Join the women of faith ministry. Read about the king's men. Join the king's men's ministry. You can read about compassion and action, the feet. Our feeding program, Hope Over Hunger, that we do every week and become a volunteer. I anything we do is as easy as taking your phone out and join, support, learn, know, participate. This cuts down on so much time and so much work. Now you can work on the ministry as opposed to the process. Am I making sense? Now, how many of y'all are connected to KBGF? You have to be because you're here. That's why you, your hand ought to, every hand ought to be up. That's a trick question. All right. Uh, is, Deont is Kirkland or Deontay in the room? All right, come on quickly. Talk about the KBGF app. So in your app store, uh, how many of you have an iPhone? All right. How many of you have an Android? Keep your hands up. You got an iPhone, keep your hands up. You got an Android, keep your hands up. All right. You can go to either your Apple uh, store or you can go to your Google Play store. Uh, that's the process for download. You'll type in KBGF. That's the search, just KBGF. You download the app on your phone. Now, the app can do so many things, as Bishop had just said, uh, with our KBGF app, you'll know uh, when times for the classes are starting uh, today, you'll have instant messaging. If we need to get a message out to everyone really quick, I mean, with the, with the click of a button, you'll get a notification. You can also uh, look at classes, change your classes. Um, how many of you from out of town? All right, how many of you been using Uber since you've been in Houston? Some kind of service, driving service, anything. Even on the app, we have a ride share. You click that button, and you can get your Uber through the app. We also, we will have notes uh, throughout the app as well. So how many of you have the, saw the paperwork that, that Bishop uh, gave this morning for the general session available on the app? Yeah. Now watch this. How many of you are registered for a class, one class, but you wanted to take another one so you couldn't choose between the two? <laughs> watch this. On the app, Next week, that class will be available for you to go back and watch. So the app is very beneficial to everything that we're doing at the conference, uh, even streaming and uh, streaming and all of those purposes and everything. The app is very beneficial. Now, uh, after after this conference is over, we're starting uh, teaching and training ongoing. That things that we'll be teaching every month to all the pastors. We've got a pastors uh, empowerment. We've got another piece for pastors and leaders. Guess what? You'll be able to access that live information, those live experiences. <laughs> Don't be slow on purpose. Come on, say on the app. <laughs> hey, hey, man. I want, come on, everybody say on the app. Okay. Yes, yeah, so, so if you have the app and it's free, download it. And on the app, you'll be able to access all of that information. So wherever you are in the world, you won't have to miss 
anything, you're always up to speed. And I want to thank my friend and brother, uh, Pastor Michael Stevens, for bringing this opportunity to us. Come on, give him another hand. Thank God for him. Thank God for him. Thank God for him. And uh, he and his wife are, are amazing people. Uh, he's now also on the board of NTZ. I know trafficking's on. And his wife, what's your wife's uh, uh, professional? She's a licensed therapist for children. And so she's now a part of our advisory council for No Trafficking Zone. So all, listen, you ready to keep up with all of that information? Where? On the app. Isn't that powerful? Yes, Amen. The name of the company is In Peace. Now, uh, uh, we have a table set up, right? Or there's a table set up in the Faith Atrium. In the Faith Atrium, go by there. It won't take you long to get information. Download it. It's, listen, $69 a month. Come on. Come on, say, get, get, get the app. All right, God bless you. Amen. All right, we are so excited. We're thankful to God. We want to move forward now. We've got a tremendous, tremendous, tremendous uh, speaker for this luncheon. I'm excited. The classes are going to be amazing. As soon as we finish with the speaker, we're going rushing to our classes for our afternoon experiences. Uh, Tanya, talk to me quickly about our experience with Hope Over Hunger. That's tomorrow, am I right? T and, yeah, I saw them cars out there. I didn't know. Come, come tell me about these cars all out there on the parking lot, girl. I saw them cars out there. What they doing? <laughs> Y'all have seen my sister. She's a hard worker. Come on, Tanya Dixon. Thank you so much, Bishop Dixon. Today is not Wild Wednesday as normal. It is the terrific Thursday. And the Hope Over for Hunger food distribution is going on as we speak. I'm certain that as you came into the parking lot, you saw people parked along the perimeter of the driveway. That's how our driveway looks every week. They knew that we were not starting beginning serving until 12 noon, and the cars still began uh, driving up and parking at 6.30 this morning. People were calling me saying, people are already here. No, they're not here for the conference. They're here, that's what they do for the Hope Over Hunger food distribution. A beautiful thing, we feed, uh, provide groceries for over 3,000 families of people every week, <laughs> every week. Not only are we feeding their spiritual, their physical bodies, but we are giving them some spiritual food because we are uplifting them through the love of Jesus Christ as we serve them through our hands and what our feet are doing. Uh, some of you may have gotten been privileged to see me outside talking to them because I build relationship with them. And they are so excited about what's going on in here today, out there. They're excited. And so please... Um, compassion in action is what we do here. We're giving you an opportunity. Come out. I know you might not be dressed too much up to par, but just come out and experience because when you go over to the area, you're going to feel the power of love, which is the power of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Bishop. Um, as soon as you get out of class, we won't take you out of, away from class. Don't y'all skip class and come over there. I know it's tempting already. Um, but after class, meet us over there. Um, and I would have transform, uh, transformed as well by then. All right, so listen, as soon as the class is over, the afternoon class, we want you to spend an hour. This is kingdom work, mm -hmm. okay? And one of the things that we're looking to do with KBGF, I told you that's about five different things we want to do completely KBGF-wide. One of them is compassion and action and hope over hunger. If we can network all of our churches, to do this once a week, and we'll give you the way to do it. I, I hate going to conferences where they give you all these amazing things they do, then they don't tell you how. You know, it's like they want to be the only it doing something. You ever been to a conference like that? I mean, they, they uh, ooh, we do this, well, they don't tell you how. Because they, they want you to keep coming to their conference not knowing how. Okay. We want, we want to partner. This is about sharing information, how to do it. And we work with the Houston Food Bank. We're probably their number one preferred kind of partner because of what we do. So the Food Bank, we talk with them. They are going to partner with us, with any of our churches around the country, with their sister uh, networks across the country. And we are now are going to be able to apply for a grant 
we want to get 30 churches in 30 different cities that would do this. Are there any pastors who will say, this, this sounds exciting to me? That's what I'm talking about. I, I'm, I'm saying, can you imagine 30 to 40 churches feeding one, two, three, and 4,000 people a week per church? That's kingdom impact. That's what this elevation and increase for expanded kingdom impact is all about, sharing our resourcefulness. Am I making sense? Okay. And uh, so that's what we're up to. I want you to go over and ex experience it and see it so you can taste it. It's contagious. It, it, it is absolutely contagious. And our team, I want all of our Hope of Hungers and our CIA uh, workers to stand. Any of our volunteers, y'all stand wherever you are. Just stand. So a lot of them are across the street. Come on, give them a hand. Give them a hand. Now, now while they are in here with us, there are another 30 or 40 across the street already serving those people uh, at, our, at, our, at our campus right across, right across the street. So as soon as the, the classes are over, rush out and uh, spend a few minutes loosen your tie, go out, smile, shake some, ha shake some hands, and see the smiles on the faces of the people coming to the line. You don't get up and put your car on the line at 6.30 a.m. They wait for hours to get those few bags of groceries because poverty is painful. Are y'all with me? But love is lifting. C come on. Come on. Tell you the power is painful. But love is lifting. Amen. At this time, I'm so excited to bring our speaker, uh, my friend and my brother. I could, I could introduce him for 30 minutes and not run out of great things to say about him. Uh, we've been colleagues for years. We were doctoral colleagues at Liberty, at, at uh, Virginia University of Lynchburg. And uh, I <laughs> Coleman, Coleman almost had a stroke when I said that. Our professor and doctoral uh, administrator was Dr. James Edward Coleman, Jr. Stand, Dr. Coleman. Uh, he is a PhD of PhDs. Dr. Coleman is smarter by accident than all of us here on purpose. Uh, I mean, he, he just... He, he's just scary kind of smart, you know? And, uh, but, uh, but, but, but Bishop Breon Hall and I were teasing him because when we did our dissertations, had to defend him, I mean, he was not our friend. You gotta say, he was not our friend when we were students. You, you understand? And he grilled us, had us sweating bullets. And we, we in the room together, me and Breon, man, we like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, and, I mean, and he and Dr. Marsha Mays, uh, that Hutchins, and they were just, I mean, had us sweating bullets. I never shall forget, we're in the uh, in definitization, and Dr. Marsha Mays looked at Breon Hall. He says, <clears throat> Breon, I love my mother. He said, but I failed my mother. It hurt me. And if I failed my mama, I fail you. <laughs> I, 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 I was sitting next. I was sitting there. I said, it's going to be all right. Now. <laughs> Lord have mercy. They drilled us so bad. But now, Dr. Bishop designate James Coleman is under us. And and he's, he has to pass our test to get consecrated Saturday. It comes around, Doc. It comes around. It comes around. It comes around. So when he stands up there Saturday, we ask him a few questions. We intend to... <laughs> Breon Hall is a preacher pastor of the New Psalmist Church in Toledo, Ohio. He is known nationally and globally for his preaching prowess, his ministry acumen, but more than that, he is one of the leading experts on matters of the episcopacy. He understands church leadership historically. He understands it culturally and certainly biblically better and more than most people you would ever meet or know. To that end, I want you to receive 
my friend and brother, he's going to teach us today, preach to us about honoring kingdom leadership. Celebrate him now, Bishop Rian Hall. It's always a task to stand in front of people who sit at a table with food in front of them. I want us to, just for a few seconds, do what we've done all day and that is honor the visionary of this experience. I am honored to call him friend and I'm super excited that the Lord allows me to call him brother. I watched uh, today with great anticipation of what God would do for the 21st century church that has allowed the ethos of its theology to be shaped by people who are considered to be novice. The church must enter into a revival of repentance because of how we have allowed things to happen in the church. And then we have the audacity to say that it's God. We have infiltrated the church of Jesus Christ with our own philosophy and ideologies and have not understood the real foundation on which we build. Prior to Socrates, Aristotle, and Plato, prior to Cypriot and Tertullian, prior to Irenaeus and Ignatius, there was Jesus Christ. And we have failed to align ourselves with the true lineage of what Jesus meant when he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. I struggled with my assignment. Give me 15 minutes, please. Because I understood something very practical in order for us to really authentically honor God, we must first love God. When we look at what the pandemic has produced, it has produced a generation of individuals who have fallen away from God, who have not appreciated that it was God that kept them. And therefore, churches that should be filled with people who are worshiping and honoring him have now become dissipated with those who have no knowledge of who he is and cares nothing about what he's able to do. The scripture says, now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless. The reality is, is that many of us who are part of the postmodern Christian church have believed that we have brought ourselves, we have taught ourselves, and we have kept ourselves. In this room, can you just lift your hands and declare, it was God that kept me. I need you to do me one favor, and that is simply this. Find a praiser in your uh, section and just please tell them it was God that kept me. That was the wrong one. Would you find somebody else that looks like they will talk back to you and tell them it was God that kept me? I, I need some real believers that understand that you did not keep yourself 
You did not bring yourself. You did not help yourself. It was the power and the anointing of God that kept you through storms that almost caused you to devastate yourself. Would you lift your hands and say, God, thank you for keeping me. My assignment is to talk about honoring God while honoring kingdom leaders. Let's be definitive for a moment and let's identify what a real kingdom leader is. A real kingdom leader is one who understands that before I'm ever elevated, I've got to first be isolated. I must be okay with being by myself. If I am afraid to be alone, I'm afraid to ascend. If I'm afraid to be kept as a hostage to God, I'm afraid to go to the next level. So every believer that's in this building, every leader, every pastor, every bishop, if you had a moment where you have felt like you are by yourself, I need you to grab your appraiser and tell them I'm getting closer to my destiny. If you have ever felt as if you were isolated by people and people never understood you because you will never know how anointed you are until you have people that are connected to you that try to assassinate you. You will never know how anointed you are until you've got people that said they loved you, but yet when they get an opportunity, they try to destroy the very nature of your character. They are people who benefit from your ministry, benefit from your anointing, but if they hear one thing about you, they're ready to destroy the caliber of who you are. I need you to open your mouth and declare, I must be anointed. I need you to do me a favor and find somebody close to you and tell them I must be anointed because I've got people who are around me, get this, who annoy the very fabric of who I am. Don't tell me that you are in ministry and you like everybody. Don't tell me that you are in ministry and everybody likes you. Don't tell me that you are in ministry and there are days that you don't feel like cussing and fussing and giving up and throwing in the towel because when you are anointed you will be annoyed be seated y'all I'm, I'm almost there you will be anointed somebody just shout with me do it Dr. Bray do it you, you must understand that God places you in the pivotal spot for you to understand that in order for the anointing on your life to increase you've got to be around people who don't like who you are but need what you've got Okay, y'all missed it. Uh, let me talk to somebody over here. I need you to find a praise uh, and tell them you must understand that God will put you around people who don't like who you are but need what you've got. And I need a screamer to open your mouth uh, and begin to praise God for what's on your life. Uh, and praise him because you know that no weapon formed is going to prosper. Be seated. I'm just talking. I'm just the luncheon lecturer. Turn me up, please. What you must understand is that God has positioned you for something far greater than where you are. And the scripture says that I have not seen ear, have not heard, neither have it entered into the heart of man what God has in store for you. And so in 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah is sentenced by God to go to the brook of Sherith. He sent us to go to the brook of Sherith, and the Bible says, God says, I want you to leave where you are and go to the brook of Sherith, and I have commanded ravens to bring you bread and food, get this, and you are to eat by the brook of Sherith. So he does what God tells him. He goes and he hides himself by the brook of Sherith. And the scripture says when he gets there that the ravens bring him food in the morning. The ravens bring him food in the evening. And after a few days, the Bible says that the very place that was giving him refreshment dries up. Not only does the brook dry up, but the ravens stop coming. How, I feel Jesus right here, can you trust a God you can't trace? 
how can you trust a God who has apparently let you down? The ravens have stopped coming and the brook has dried up. God speaks to him and says, my bad, I want you to leave where you are, get up, and go to Zarephath. And there I've commanded, uh, Pastor Hamna, a widow woman there to sustain you. When he gets there, the Bible says, here it is, when he gets there, the scripture says that the woman is gathering sticks. She's gathering sticks. God says, I'm sending you to a widow to sustain you. When he gets there, she's gathering sticks. He says to her, go fetch me. I'm going somewhere. A little water in a, in a vessel. And she runs again. He says, while you're going, do me one more favor. Fetch me, I pray thee, a little morsel in your hand. She says, sir, uh, as the Lord lives, uh, I have not but a little oil and a little meal to make a cake for me and my son that we may eat and die. And the prophet says, make mine first. How insensitive is the pastor when I'm in a pandemic and he's still asking me to give my best? How, how insensitive is it is for me to be at my wit's end and the pastor is trusting that God's going to use me to give my best. How do I give my best when my best looks like my last? Make mine first. She says, y'all about to shout in the back, all I have, Mother Barbara, Mother, Mother Wilder Jean, all I have is a little meal and a little oil. All I feel God I have is a little meal and a little oil. Somebody shout, all I've got is a little left. But I need a praiser to open your mouth and thank God for this conference because you came with a little oil. And God says by the time you leave, I'm going to start replenishing it. Sit down, sit down. She does what the prophet says. She does what the prophet says. And the Bible says that he and she and her whole household did eat many days because of what came out of the prophet's mouth. I'm trying to, um, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to help, I'm trying to help. Um, Professor Walter Brueggemann has a book entitled uh, Prophetic Imagination that says if it can ever get in the mind of the prophet and the prophet speaks it out of his mouth, it's got to come to pass for those that are connected to the mouthpiece of the prophets. I, I need every worshiper in here to open your mouth and thank God for your prophet. I need you to scream for what's about to get in your prophet's mind because if it gets in his mind and comes out of his mouth it's got to come I need a screamer to open your mouth and declare it's got to come to pass Where did the whole household come from? God said, he's about to produce for you generational wealth. I'm prophesying now. God said, he's about to bless you and everything connected to you. Because you honor what God has given to you. There's, there's a young man that's hanging out with Elijah. 2 Kings chapter uh, 2, he says, whatever you ask of me, I'm almost there. I'm going to do it. He says, I want a double portion 
of your spirit. I don't want your chariot. I don't want the car you drive. I want a double portion of your spirit. I'm afraid that the problem that many of you pastors have is that you are raising up Elishas that want a double portion of your anointing without having to experience the dryness of a well. You can't get, oh Jesus, a double portion without experiencing a dried brook. Too many preachers that you all are raising are trying to do what you do and be who you are, but they're trying to do it without dried brooks. Elijah says, I'm almost done. You're asking for something hard. But if you stay connected, you can have it. If you see me when I'm taken up, he, he honors his prophet. He doesn't ask for God to do it with a contingency plan. He doesn't ask God to revert it. He doesn't ask God to take him around it. He says, I just want a double portion. I don't know how many believers we have in the building that can honestly admit the fact that you want what's on your leader's life. God help me. I, I, I need you to open your mouth and say, God, whatever is on my leader, I need it to be on me. God help me. If it's on my church, I need it to be on my family. If, it, if it's on my pastor, I need it to be on my life. If it's on my leader, I need it to be on mine. But watch this here. You can never get what you don't invest in. So in chapter 6, Elisha has a chance to demonstrate the anointing that he got from his prophetic father. There are people that are in this room that want to change the world, but George Bernard Shaw says they can't change their mind. They want to do international ministry, but they're not learn to have a local adaptation. Text says that Elisha, who is the son of Elijah, in chapter 6, is coming together for a conference with his sons. When they get with him, they say two things to him. Sir, the place where we dwell with you is too small. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to tell you that God is replacing popular voices with proficient voices. Somebody who feels as if God has overlooked you. God said you're getting closer to your miracle. Here it is for 25 of y'all that will shout. He says, when you give me glory the next time, I'm moving you to the front of the line because I saved the best for last. I need a screamer to open up your mouth and declare, God saved the best for last. I don't have a worldwide ministry yet. God was saving the best. Sit down, I'm just a lecturer. Notice, ladies and gentlemen, didn't come to him and say, we've outgrown you. You've got leaders that you're raising who feel like they can do it better than you. That's why we've got to repent for how we've allowed them to treat us. 
and they can't repent for how they treated us until we retreat and go back to God and repent for how we've allowed them to be too common with us. I, I don't like familiarity because familiarity breeds contentment. I don't, I don't know you like that. I, I ain't meet you like that. You ain't meet me growing up. You don't know who the real person. You don't know me by my first name. You don't know me from where I come. You don't know where I've been and what I've been through. You don't know me like that. Stop trying to step to me because I've made you feel welcomed. Because there's a thin line between feeling welcomed and you getting comfortable. Everybody can't handle being your armor bearer. Everybody can't handle the private you because all they know is the public you. Everybody can't handle you when the lights go off at night. You've got to make sure that you try the spirit by the spirit. Elijah is to, to this chapter what, what Jesus is to the New Testament. Did I tell y'all that Elijah is to this chapter what Jesus is to the New Testament? Uh, he says the place where we dwell with you is too small. Let us, let us go, I pray thee, and over the Jordan, every man take a beam. And the prophet says, here it is, y'all. He says, go. I'm prophesying to some praiser that's in the building. God says you've been waiting on your answer. And your answer for your next level is go. I need you to grab a praiser by the hand, squeeze him by the hand as a neighbor. You just got your one word prophecy. Go. You, you've been waiting on a clearance from God. You have been waiting on God to speak. And I hear the Holy Ghost said, if you give me glory, I'm going to give you the green light. I, I need a praiser to open up your mouth and scream like you lost your mind. I just got the green light. I wish you'd find somebody on your road and tell them, go, 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 go. Find a screamer on your road and tell them, go, 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 go. They got his permission. They go back to him. He says, sir, thank you for the permission. We honor you for giving us the permission. But, sir, we don't want to go to this next level without you. Because this is not about exposure for us. This is about expansion for you. And, Dixon, I am praying that God gets rid of the people connected to you that want exposure for them and not expansion for you. God, I, I wish we opened up our mouth and praise God for our leader's expansion. Because God, if you bless him, you've got to bless me. I don't need exposure if my leader's not being expanded. Elisha is to this chapter what Jesus is to the New Testament. He says, go. They said, we want you to go with us. He goes back to them and says, I will go. I need you to get this. When you honor your kingdom leader, there's something about being in their presence. Some of you will miss what God's trying to download in your deoxyribonucleic acid. Because you refuse to shut your mouth long enough to listen. That's your DNA. To refuse to listen and stay still long enough to hear what your man of God or your woman of God is saying. So you miss the move of God because you talk too much. I'm sorry. I'm messing up. I'm sorry. He says, I'm, I'm going to go. I want your presence. Did, did I tell you all that Elisha said this chapter what Jesus 
is to the New Testament. It says, it says, I will go. Something about being in his presence. The Bible says when they go, they're cutting down wood. And the axe head, I'm done, falls in the water. One of the young men go back to him and say to him, this is why we needed you. Because we didn't need to have a disconnect just in case we ran into a problem. And I need y'all to understand that just because you have his presence and his permission does not mean you still won't have a problem. Now, this is going to sound crazy, but I need you to grab your neighbor for the second time and say, neighbor, what you don't understand is that I've learned how to praise God for my problems. I've, I've learned how to shout for every problem that I had because the more I go through, the closer I'm getting. And I need some screamer to open your mouth and start thanking God for the fact that you're closer than you've ever been. Show me where you lost it. Can I tell you all this? This is amazing. This is a brook. A brook is flowing water. Here's what is amazing is that y'all are going to shout on your way home on this. You'll catch it on your way home. You can never step in the same water twice. I'm sorry, but you, you, you can't ever step in the same water twice because it's ever moving. I, I need somebody to grab a praiser on your row and say, neighbor, you won't step over me but once because I'm ever moving. I need a screamer to open up your mouth and start thanking God for all of those that tried to walk over you and step over you. Tell them you only got one chance. Show me. Show me where you lost it. Show me where you lost it. Go, go back to where you lost it. Some of you came to this conference and you were empty. You were broken. You lost your joy. You lost your anointing. You, you lost your drive. And God says this week, show me where you lost it. You, you lost your ability to fight. You were ready to quit before you came. You were ready to fold up the ministry before you got here. And God says, show me where you lost it. I, I need you to go around your table and just tell on your table if you show God where you lost it. Today is the day that you find it again. I need a screamer to open up your mouth. Shout like you lost. I want to find what I lost. Did I, did I, did I, did I tell you that Elijah is to this chapter Dr. Coleman? what Jesus is the New Testament. I'm, I'm just a VUL student. I'm a Bible preacher. Uh, did, did I tell you all that, that Elisha is to this chapter what Jesus is the New Testament? Show, show me where you lost it. All, all the young man has is an ax handle. He loses, watch this, Satora, the axe head. You cannot cut wood with wood. God, I feel the Holy Ghost. You need the axe head. Some of you have been trying to do ministry with an axe handle. Because your church has lost the axe head.
Can I tell you that Elisha is to this chapter what Jesus is to the New Testament. The Acts head represents the Holy Ghost. You, you cannot do ministry without the Holy Ghost. I need you to look at the neighbor close to you and just ask them what's in your hand. The prophet says, I've got to get the axe head and the axe handle back together. Here's what bothered me. Why didn't he use the axe handle that the boy had? When the Lord finished speaking to me, it was like an ontological argument. He says, the reason that I didn't use the one that was in my hand is because it's already proven not to work. So I got to figure out how to get the axe head and the axe handle back together. Did I tell y'all? That Elisha is to this chapter what Jesus is to the New Testament. The text says that Elisha goes and chops down a tree and throws it in, and the iron did swim. Jesus said, If I go, the comforter is going to come. Elisha used a tree. Did I tell y'all that Jesus and Elisha are synonymous? In order for Jesus to get the Holy Ghost back with the church, he used a tree. I'm Baptist. Good evening, y'all. May the Lord bless you real good, but on a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. I need a screamer to open up your mouth and say thank you for the cross. Is there anybody that can open up your mouth and start screaming for the cross? Would you grab a praiser on your own and say neighbor I thank God for the cross. If when you give the best of your service telling the world that the Savior has come be not dismayed when men won't believe you. He will understand and say well done. If when you tried but you failed in your trying, nail scarred hands from the battle you've begun, pick up your cross, run quickly to meet him. He'll understand and say well done. Oh, when I come to the end of my journey, weary of life, the battle's fought and the victory's been won. Carrying a staff and the cross of redemption, he'll understand and say, well done. Good evening, y'all. May the Lord bless you real good. But I got one question for you. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he fight your battles? Won't he open up doors? Open your mouth and scream for it. Open your mouth and clap for it. Open your mouth and jump for it. A praise goes behind that. In case you don't know it, a praise goes behind that. Let me quickly try to bring us to conclusion. Good to see you, Bishop Blake. Let me 
let me try to bring this session. Listen to me very carefully. We're going to go quickly to our classes, but hear me very good. You have to know and sense where you are. Some people miss their blessing because they don't know where they are. People who were right around Jesus and never got what he had. There, there, there were people who were right around Jesus, just never got what, what he had because they didn't know who they were with. They didn't know where they were. They had no idea. They just did not know. They did not know. They did not know. I mean, when you think about it, they just did not know where they were and who they were with. They, they had the same opportunities. I mean, think about it. That when, when Bartimaeus, the blind man, got healed, there were some other blind folk that stayed blind. They just missed the moment. They didn't know who they were around, did not know. They, they were on the road where healing showed up. They, they just didn't recognize it, so they stayed blind. And the, and the Bible says the only one that got healed was the one who shouted. Isn't it amazing that, that all of them were blind, but the only one that got healed was the one who shouted? Can, 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 I, can I tell you all up in here right now, there's somebody you really need was in this room. But you haven't figured out it yet. You, you got to shout to get it. See, 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 listen, listen. When Bartimaeus cried out, he shouted with a loud voice. Jesus said, okay, bring that one to me. All the rest of the blind folk, he didn't even bother with them, didn't even send time. Because he only paid attention to the one who recognized who was in the room. Can I say something right now? Somebody to recognize. See, the issue is we come into the room, we looking for Jesus. But Jesus shows up in somebody. Oh, God. I said, Jesus shows up. When I listened to Bishop Brian Hall today, he said that there was a man sent by God to a brook. And then the brook's right up. Then that man was sent to a widow woman. And that widow woman was about to die with her child, but she recognized what was in the man. You, you, God didn't show up. The man showed up. But because God was in the man, the man could do what God wanted done. And often we miss what's in the room because we miss what's in the man in the room with us. Oh, God. I, I, I want you to understand. See, if you don't shout at the right moment when the right person is in the room, you miss what the man brought into that environment. And I need to level with you very honestly. When the axe head fell into the water, they didn't say, God, get the water, get the axe head. They said, Elijah, we need you to go with us because we got a problem. We need a man that got the power with that. I'm trying to say to you, there's somebody in your midst that God always wants to use. But if you don't treat the man right, you don't get what God put in the man. And many of us are so stubborn. I know this is not a good. See, y'all want to shout because it's all about Jesus, and it is. But I want you to understand something, that Jesus did not walk in this room with two feet. Jesus walks in the room in somebody else. And unless you honor the God in the man that God gave you, you can't get what God gave it to bring you. Now, see how you're not shouting now? See, you were shouting as long as you was talking about somebody you couldn't see. It's easy to honor what's invisible. But you can't honor what's visible. That widow woman looked at a man and went and got that oil and that, and that meal and cooked his meal. She didn't see God. She saw a man. But she heard the man of God speaking for God, obeyed it and honored it, and her whole household kept eating. The Lord, I, I sat there, I wanted to shout the whole time, but the Lord was speaking to me and said, there are some people who are starving right now. Because you are not honoring the Elijah in your life. The Elijah in second in the Kings is not here. You can shout about him all day. Where's the Elijah in your life? Uh, I didn't say this, Bishop Hall, ever before. I've told this to my sister, my family, some other people. I said these words, if God gave me one option to say, I'm going to give you one subject, I said this to Pastor Brown, to preach on for the rest of your life. You got one subject you can teach and preach forever. You can't preach anything but that one thing. What, 
what I choose to preach about. I said I would preach about honor. Honor. Because nothing great happens without it. But everything great happens with it. If there is not honor, is, is it, try it. Tell your neighbor, honor, honor. is the key to access. Whoever you honor, you access their power. You can never access anyone's power who you don't honor. And we have raised a culture of dishonor. Everything he just got through preaching about yeah. happened because somebody was honoring. Oh that woman didn't eat because she was cute. Nope. She didn't eat because she was fine. Nope. She ate because she honored yeah. the man of God. Yeah. That axe head swam because they honored yeah. the prophet Elijah. Yeah. And we are to honor it too arrogant. We're too busy trying to impress other people with who you don't need. And you'll never honor anybody you don't think you need. I want you to leave this room today convinced that honor is the principle to access. It's a kingdom principle. It works anywhere in the world at any time. You show up honoring and you're going to get access to the power of what's ever available. Chief McClellan, stand please. Chief McClellan is a former police chief of our city. What, hold on, wait a minute. What did I just call him? Chief, Chief McClellan. Chief. I've never called him Chuck. All right. All right. He's my friend. I have never walked up and said, hey, Chuck. Never. Nothing I've ever asked him did he not do. I have access because of honor. I appointed him to the executive committee of the NAACP after I became the president. I still honor him as Chief McClellan. I will never be on a first name basis with somebody God made a chief. Here's a quick lesson we're out of here. Honor always looks like the adjustment you make in its presence. Honor always looks like the adjustment you make in its presence. In some people's presence, you should not ever open your mouth. I'm making an adjustment to be quiet because I'm in the presence. Some of y'all talking in the presence of your pastor all the time, shut up. You are dishonoring. In some people's presence, you don't have an opinion. Well, this is how I feel about it. You just lost access. 
When I, I tell them what I think, I, you just lost access. And it's that spirit in our churches that's killing. That's why the axe head is in the water. Did y'all hear what he said? That church is trying to minister with a handle and no axe head. What happened to it? Honor. And now you don't even have the relationship with Elijah for him to cut a tree down on your behalf. Because you didn't take him with you. Praise God for this preacher again. Stop. Freeze. Freeze. Stop. Stop, 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 stop clapping. Stop clapping. Stop clapping. Stop. No, no. I just got through saying honor is the adjustment you make in the presence of who you're honoring. Now, I just said thank God for this preacher. Not a dancer, not a singer, not a basketball player, not a baseball player. You didn't stand up because that's not an adjustment you thought it demanded. I'm not, I'm not picking at you. I'm teaching you. There are some things you ought to sit down on. But there are some things you stand on. Okay, listen. Take me to the courtroom, Judge uh, uh, Chief McClellan. You've been there with the hardened criminals. The, the worst thug on the streets shows up in, in, in the courtroom. But when that judge walks in... He stands up like he got some sense because the judge has power. Now, I'm saying to you, if a hard thug was standing for a judge about to send him to prison, surely, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fussing now, I'm teaching because sometimes we don't even know when we're doing some things. What does honor look like? It looks like an adjustment. And it looks like the immediate adjustment we make. And the more significant the adjustment, the more the honor. Yeah. Oh, God. Some places you don't show up without a dress and a suit and a tie. You say, but I don't wear suits and ties. But I'm making an adjustment because of where I'm going. I got to honor the place and the person. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I making sense? And if we ever get this principle of honor back, we'll get the axe head back. And your ministry will be sharp enough to cut down some more timber. But you got to get the principle of honor straight. Would you honor and celebrate and praise God for this preacher that just got through sharing the word of God with us? Let's all stand together. We're all standing now. Father, in Jesus' name, bless the rest of our afternoon. Thank you for the word of God that we just got. Thank you for the teaching and for the information and the illustration and the application. And thank you ultimately, Lord God, that for the celebration because we got the axe head back today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right? All right. While you're standing, because I know you're sleepy. Uh, so we're going to transition into classes.